and then I'm going to share my presentation with you so that you can all follow along at home, hopefully. There we go. Okay, so can you all see um, the pre PowerPoint presentation in front of you now? Yeah, I'm going to presume that you're all saying yes in the chat. If not, Caroline, you can wave at me. Um, so, um, first of all, ah, thank you, the thumbs up, excellent. So, first of all, I've got here, you've got my Twitter tag and also um, my Twitter handle, and there's also the hashtag that I've been using. Um, feel free to use the hashtag uh, or tweet me if you're wanting to live tweet this and or if you're wanting to find other people I know from the second session that people wanted to kind of meet up with each other after the after the class and chat to each other So you can use the hashtag to do that and find each other obviously um, So what am I going to be doing today? What is this romancing the gothic when love and death embrace? Um, also, by the way, a couple of you caught that hymn reference. I was very pleased about that um, well, what I'm going to be doing today is um, a sort of survey or overview of the ways in which the Gothic and romance have always been interconnected, right from the very earliest days in the 18th century. Um, I'm going to be, as I said, doing an overview. So I know that quite a lot of the people here are experts in their own field or massive enthusiasts with a great wealth of knowledge. Um, and um, some of the bits I'll be going over more quickly than you might might like, but um, as I say, it's an overview. So we're not going into anything a, a proper deep dive. But you, if you have any questions, you can always ask those in the breaks. Um, the picture that I've chosen there, I don't know if any of you are from Russia, um, but that is an illustration to a Russian poem called Demon by Lermontov. Um, and it is the picture of... Um, a demon who fell in love with a human woman, but as soon as he kissed her, she died. So I thought it was quite a good image for our discussion of gothic and romance, love and death together. So I've said that I'm going to take you back to the beginning. Um, don't read the, the quote yet. We don't need to. And, and the beginning is quite often considered to be um, the castle of Otranto. Um, by, seven, uh, by Horace Walpole, written in 1764. Now, there is a certain amount of scholarly debate. If you can still see a little picture of me, I'm holding up um, one of the other contenders for the prize, which is Longsword Earl of Salisbury by John Leyland, which was written in 1762. But um, the Castle of Otranto is often considered to be the first, um, precisely because it called itself a Gothic story. And in the preface to the second edition, Horace Walpole also explained or theorized what this gothic novel was and he talked about it as a mixed romance so it would be very easy for my talk if that was romance with a small r and it meant uh, love stories but it's not um, so the quote at the side there he explains what he means that the gothic novel was an attempt to blend two kinds of romance the ancient and the modern so by ancient romance, he's talking about um, the medieval romances, um, things like the, the quest narratives and the Arthurian tales, tales full of magic, fantasy, um, quests, um, martial valor, imagination. Um, and he's comparing that with the modern romance, so the novel of the 18th century. Um, he's using the term romance to describe the novel. Um, works like Pamela or Carissa by people like Henry Fielding, those 18th century tomes that focus on um, a very detailed description of supposedly everyday life. And he's saying that those ancient romances, they weren't very practical, they weren't very realistic, but at least they were fun, they were imaginative. And he's saying that the novel, it, it has copied nature, sometimes with success, but fancy is wanting interest is wanting basically and so what he's setting to do uh, with the gothic novel is combine those two things so make something that's fantastic and magical and exciting and also realistic it's rather debatable if his claims about realism are in any way um, factual but so why am i talking about it well i think it's a really good example of the way in which the gothic was um, intertwined with romance right from the beginning because the Castle of Otranto is about all sorts of things, usurpation, hereditary, there's quite a complicated theological critique going on as well. But there's also, it's 
um, many of the subplots are to do with romance subplots. So that's intertwined and inextricable from the narrative. So let, if you've not read it, let me give you a little bit of an overview. Um, the main character is Manfred, who is the Lord of Otranto. And he is a usurper, sort of. His grandfather was a usurper. His grandfather murdered the true Lord Alfonso and their family has been the Lords ever since. Um, so he is married to Hippolyta and they have two children, Matilda and Conrad. And when the novel opens, we open on the day of Conrad's wedding. Um, but Conrad is nowhere to be found. <laughs> He's gone missing, where could he possibly be? Um, well, it turns out if you look at the back of this slide, you can find out where he is. He has been smushed to death by a massive helmet. Um, so this is a tragedy, obviously, but for Ma Manfred, Manfred's sort of more interested in the fact that, not in the, the fact that his son is squished on the pavement next to him, but that it appears to be that the curse against his family is coming true. Now he had wanted Conrad to marry Isabella, whose father is Frederick. He wanted Conrad to marry Isabella because she was the last known heir of Alfonso, the true ruler of Otranto. And so he thought that by marrying his son to her, he would be able to avert the curse. So when his son dies, he has to rethink. And he decides, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to marry Isabella myself. Perfect plan. Not a perfect plan, unfortunately, because um, first of all, he's already married to Hippolyta. Secondly, Isabella is very much not interested in marrying him. And when he tries to force his attentions upon her, she flees from him in a very sort of stereotypical uh, trope starting Gothic adventure where she's running through the subterranean tunnels to the next door monastery. Um, there's also a problem in the form of Theodore. So Theodore is a young supposed peasant, supposed, um, who, um, appears around the time, around the same time as the helmet. He ends up helping Isabella escape, but is left behind himself and imprisoned. Isabella, of course, has fallen in love with him. So you have the first love subplot there. But Theodore, Theodore isn't really bothered <laughs> about Isabel, Isabella. He meets Matilda and they mutually fall in love with each other. So you've got a love triangle now at the center of the novel. And it becomes a love square because um, Theodore, um, sorry, Isabella's father, Federico, sees Matilda and he wants to marry her. And so he and Manfred are going to do a sort of daughter swap. They're each going to marry each other's daughters because that's great. Um, and so you've got this very complicated uh, sort of love connections going on or marital connections at the least. But it all goes to pot in the end because uh, Manfred accidentally stabs his daughter to death. Um, and everything, the, the castle falls down, the curse is enacted, and we find out that Theodore, the supposed peasant, is actually the heir to, to the castle of Otranto. Um, he's the son of Father Jerome, who is married to the true heir of Alfonso, blah, blah, blah. So we have um, here in this first Gothic novel, we have all of these romance subplots, but what is the sort of romance and what is the sort of romantic hero that we're being introduced to here? So you'll see in some critical works that it refers to these elements of sensibility, which is something I'm going to talk about in a second. But with these very early Gothic heroes, where the action is set in a distant medieval past, what we quite often have is this celebration of chivalric values and uh, chivalric norms. So um, this is as part of a response to the, the increasing popularity of these ideas of chivalry, this kind of interest and obsession with them. There was an antiquarian called Richard Hurd who wrote um, letters on chivalry and romance. And he described this chivalric hero and the chivalric uh, love relationship a sort of courtly love. And um, it became, it was, it was a very popular book. It was very interesting to people. And that became the model for some of these early Gothic uh, love stories. So what is the chivalric hero? Well, first of all, he has to have a passion for arms, the spirit of enterprise, the honor of knighthood and the rewards of valor. So it's very much a martial sort of masculinity here. Um, he has to be interested in romantic ideas of justice, a passion for adventure, an eagerness to run to the succor of the dis distressed, and has to have a pride in redressing wrongs and removing grievances. So you have this idea of the hero um, 
obviously is an avatar of morality. Um, as somebody addicted or interested in adventures and rescues. But what you have set up here in the love relationship is instantaneously that the woman is doing very little more than being rescued all the time. The third aspect is this sense of um, the chivalric hero as, as full of courtesy, affability and gallantry. So this particular form of gentlemanly um, uh, identity. And what's the form of love related to this? Well, it's that very chaste form of courtly love where chastity is valued above all else. And Richard Hurd explains it in the idea that the violations of chastity were considered one of the most atrocious of crimes. Um, and so they would pride themselves in the glory of being its protectors. And as this virtue was of all others, the fairest and strongest claim of the sex itself to such protection, it is no wonder that the notions of it were in time carried to so platonic an elevation. So you have this idea of a love which is expressed at a distance. It's all about the pining, all about longing to touch the hem of your mistress's gown, that sort of love. Um, and you definitely see that in these early chivalric romances, this idea of this unattainable female. But it's worth noting that the, the women here don't really have much subjectivity. They're not really people so much as distant objects of adoration. Um, a couple of examples of these are the Castle of Otranto, the Old English Baron by Clara Reeve, the Castles of Athlone and Dunbane, Anne Radcliffe's first novel, and a later example is Ethelwina or the House of Fitzalban. Um, and often this idea of the chivalric hero is combined with the surprise hero. Um, like we saw in Castle of Otranto, Theodore is supposedly a peasant, but it's actually revealed that he's the Count of Falconara, the heir to Otranto. Um, similarly, in the Old English Baron, Edmund Twyford, um, his parents were murdered and his castle was usurped. He was given to a load of he was given to live with peasants, but he's actually Edmund Lord Luddle. And the story is all about him regaining his inheritance. Similarly, in the castles of Athen and Dunbane, Alan is the true uh, Baron of Dunbane, but he was done out of his inheritance as a child. So you have this idea of the surprise hero, but you can always tell even though they seem to be peasants, they have this inbuilt chivalry. So there's this certain idea connected um, to this idea of chivalric values, that it's not something necessarily learnt so much as it is indwelling. It's something that they are, they are courtly, they are chivalrous, they are noble. Um, and you also see this to some extent in Ethelwina or the House of Fitzalban. So Augustine is never um, a surprise hero. We know that he's the foster brother of the family. Um, of, of Ethelwina. But there's another trope here that's um, part of this kind of chivalric romance where he con con considers himself to be unworthy of the heroine, just as these, these surprise heroes are unworthy until they realize they're not peasants. But Augustine has to prove that he's worthy. He has to go and become a soldier. And then while he's being a soldier, she gets kidnapped and then he has to rescue her and then they can get so we have these chivalric heroes, but the Gothic relatively quickly moves on to a different model of masculinity and a different model of uh, love relationships as the core relationships that are occurring. And we're moving on to heroes of sensibility. So I'm gonna introduce you to one of the worst people in the world right now. Um, one of the foremost heroes of sensibility. And some of you may recognize him, some of you may know him, but he's from The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. And his name is Valancourt. So this is his dating profile that I made for him um, to see if I can win you over uh, with his many charms. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite gif, which I think describes him perfectly. He spends half his time crying and half his time admiring the scenery. So fairly accurate. This is his dating profile. So his name is Valancourt. His age is uncertain, but somewhere in his 20s. And his profession is theoretically soldier. Although for quite a, a significant portion of the narrative, he's not really doing anything much at all. When he meets um, Emily, the heroine of Mysteries of Udolpho, he's sort of bounding around the countryside pretending to be a hunter for some reason. Um, and then he does a lot of languishing in her garden at various locations. Um, but then when she has to leave and she gets taken by the perfidious Montoni um, into Italy, um, he 
uh, actually properly becomes a soldier, ends up going to Paris, losing his fortune, gambling and dealing with loose women. So great, well done there. Um, Valancourt. He also loves lecturing her about aesthetics, which is probably one of my top five throw person in the bin if they try it with me characteristics. Um, the three words to describe him are, and I can't see because one of your faces is there, but uh, sensitive, ineffective, and overdramatic. There you go. That's who Valancourt is. So why on earth is he the hero of the Mysteries of Udolpho? What's going on here? What is this hero of sensibility and why is he being valued? Well, the hero of sensibility is a hero that is um, representing the values of sensibility, which was an 18th century, um, not a fad per se, but it was an 18th century phenomenon, um, this interest in sensibility. And it wasn't just about, um, it wasn't just applied to women, although it off, the later it got primarily associated with women, um, it was a non-gendered value system and it was based on a number of complex philosophical and theological arguments and debates that were going on in the 18th century, specifically about the value of emotion and sentiment. So it, in terms of the ideas of sensibility is that it's emotion and sentiment that give you um, access to morality, to virtue, to aesthetic taste. All of these things are a form of taste, something that's indwelling, that's a characteristic. And a hero of sensibility, therefore, will have all of these aspects. He will be emotionally attuned to things like virtue. Um, there's a sense here of quite an interesting um, why, there's a sense here that the hero of sensibility was one of the primary heroes that women were writing for themselves. So in the late 18th century, You've had women writers before, but the late 18th century, you're seeing this absolute boom of women writers. They dominated the Gothic market. There's lots of them writing novels of manners. They're best sellers. They're really uh, to the fore of the literary market at the moment. And if you remember in Persuasion, um, when Anne is talking to Captain Benwick, I think it is, and he says to her, you know, women are less faithful than men. And she disagrees, but he says, well, look at the plays, look at the poems, look at the literature. And she says, yeah, well, they're written by men though, aren't they? Um, um, the, the pen was in men's hands, she says. But here, this is probably the first time in, in history that you see the pen being taken en masse into women's hands. And they are reimagining the heroes of these novels. And they're moving away from the sort of predatory, sexually predatory men um, of some of those early 18th century novels like Clarissa or Pamela. They're moving away from those chivalric forms of masculinity, which don't really offer much um, to the female part of that love equation. And we, as we've seen, they're just an object of adoration in the distance with very little subjectivity. But the hero of sensibility um, is sort of valuable on, on two levels. So firstly, um, the sort of sense of the values that are being applied to him, the fact that he's compassionate and caring and charitable and into music and poetry, these are non-gendered values. Or they're being portrayed as non-gendered values that belong to sensibility. And they're creating therefore already a sort of at least spiritual and emotional e e equality between the hero and heroine. Um, and you've also got this idea that these heroes aren't a threat. So the problem with uh, those predatory heroes and even chivalric heroes to a certain sense is that women have very little agency. So I've, I've, I've seen other critics, particularly like Diane Long Hoeville, talk about these heroes of sensibility as being emasculated. That's not a, a correct frame. We've got to remember that these discussions were often degendered. Sensibility was more than just a tool to to describe or control how women should be emotional and sensitive and stuff. And a really good um, example of this is David Hume's writing on sensibility. But one thing that it's worth noting with David Hume is what he's doing is he's already beginning to critique sensibility. And by the time we get these sensibility, heroes of sensibility in the 18th century, at the late 18th century in the Gothic novels, there's not this sort of blind, yes, sensibility is great. Um, often these heroes have to go on a journey from a poor form of sensibility to a more valued form of sensibility. 
So David Hume describes the delicacy of passion, a sort of bad sensibility in a way, which makes people subject, uh, sensible or sensitive to all the accidents of life. So they're always alternating between lively joy and piercing grief, going up and down all the time. He also notes that men of such lively passions are apt to be transported beyond all bounds of prudence and discretion and to take false steps in the conduct of life, which are often irretrievable. So both of these descriptions perfectly fit Balancor. He's always either in out or in the deepest of depressions. And he also allows his passions, particularly his despair, to lead him into vice and penury. He has to learn to develop delicacy of taste, a, a, a more appropriate form of sensibility, as does Emily in the same novel. So there's a delicacy of taste which resembles the delicacy of pattern, uh, pa passion and produces sens um, sensitivity or sensibility to beauty and deformity rather than the chances of life. So you're sensitive to beauty and deformity, not only like aesthetically speaking in terms of uh, art, for example, but also moral beauty. Um, ethical beauty. So this is what you should be working towards and it is something that you can work towards because our judgment will strengthen with exercise. So this is something that might be an indwelling sense but you can also develop and learn to control the dangerous side of it. So by the end of a novel like Mysteries of Udolpho you have the hero and heroine both going on journeys from a uh, a bad form of sensibility towards a better form of sensibility, whether on an equal footing um, at an emotional or spiritual level. The main problem with these heroes of sensibility and the reason arguably that they pretty much died out um, fairly early in the 19th century is that they are useless, completely useless. Um, Valancourt, for example, while Emily is being kidnapped and taken away to, well, kidnapped, she's being taken against her will to Italy with her aunt and her, the, her aunt's husband, Montoni. Um, she's being imprisoned. She's being threatened with forced marriage. She's being threatened with rape. Um, she's fleeing from bandits. During all of this time, Valancourt isn't there. Valancourt doesn't save her at any point in the novel. He's off in Paris crying and drinking and gambling and hanging out with loose women. So in these early novels, you find a dichotomy between the romantic hero and the useful hero. Um, in both cases, um, there's this emphasis again on a hero who isn't a threat to the heroine. Um, there's a, a critic called Joan Forbes and she talks about this. Um, she talks about the rise of the brother protector as another form of hero in the period. Um, not necessarily an actual brother, but maybe a cousin or um, a close friend or a family friend, somebody who's known and they're, they're not a threat because they're not a sexual threat, for example. The hero of sensibility is not a threat and the servant hero isn't a threat because the servant hero might be practical, he might be great, but he's also of a lower class. But let me introduce you to one of these servant heroes so you too can appreciate them as I do. Uh, this is Ludovico from the Mysteries of Udolpho. Um, he speaks multiple languages. He plays and sings beautifully, sensibility. He fights off enemies effectively. He saves his girlfriend, admittedly, by locking her in like a cell um, while bandits are roaming the castle. It's, but you know, effective. Sorry. <coughs> he rescues the heroine and his girlfriend and a secondary hero, DuPont, from the um, castle of Udolpho. <coughs> um, he then takes them all through Europe, helping them to escape. He, when they finally reach their next destination, he's the one who volunteers to brave a haunted room. And it's not haunted, bonus, but it is full of pirates. So he gets kidnapped by the pirates. And then he rescues everybody from the pirates because the pirates become bandits. Um, and they, the bandits attack. Uh, another family in the novel and he rescues them as well. So Ludovico just goes around being amazing all the time in the background. Um, so as I said, you've got this split between the heroes and it's something that it's worth keeping in mind when we get to the second section, we're talking about the development of the hero in the 19th century because these two things start to combine more clearly. So we've been looking at things from the perspective of female writers writing these buildings romans and um of female uh, female characters like emily the, the story of the 
development of Emily and her history and showing and creating heroes for themselves. But you've also, of course, got male writers who are also creating these happy endings. Um, but they're perhaps coming at it from a different perspective. But it's interesting to see the way in which these male buildings romance can lead to um, a very similar type of hero. And so let me introduce you to somebody and actually not introduce you so much as teach you how to become a hero so that you too can be Fabio in the background. Um, the story that I'm going to use as illustrative of the journey of how to become a hero is The Castle of St. Donuts or The History of Jack Smith. It's not very widely available. Um, so this is one that if you're really interested in it and you don't have academic access to ECHO, for example, ECCO, um, then feel free to contact me and I can send you a PDF of it. It is a trip. Anyway, this is how you become a hero. Step one, you have to find a heroine. Um, in his case, a harpist, and you should rescue her as well. You don't need to get fancy with rapiers and jewels and all of that nonsense. You can just hit somebody on the head with a rock. Effective. Then get a servant to start a fight to distract her dad while you, absolutely amped up on champagne, declare your undying love to her in a private, in a theatre, public theatre. Amazing, good choices. She might be receptive, but make sure that you put her off later. When you go to Cambridge to university, you're going to want to disgust your beloved with drunken rowdiness and dissipation. When she inevitably turns away and you ride ventre terre after her, you're gonna to want to fight a bear, preferably a bear that is attacking a thief who tried to steal a pig. You're then gonna to wanna to have a lengthy affair with a woman of loose morals and not just for like a couple of days. It's not like, oh no, I got drunk and oh, look what happened. No, 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 you're gonna to want to move to Europe with her traveling through Europe and plunging yourself into debt. When she inevitably leaves you because you're a useless waste of space, you're going to want to be conned by a prostitute into a den of murderers. <laughs> Happily for you, there should be a plucky prostitute from your home village with an intriguing secret about your past who can also help rescue you. She's my favorite character. Um, you're going to want to return home then and set yourself on a new course, perhaps to become a soldier. But Instead of embarking with your crew, you're going to want to lose all your money and miss the boat, making you technically a deserter and liable to a court martial and death. But you're on the up and up now. You're working your way up to hero status. So you're going to want to get your money back from the man who cheated you at cards. You're going to get on that ship and you're going to get attacked by pirates. So naked pirate fight. This is the way to become a hero in, in the book. It's, it's fantastic. And I love it. The, the pirates attack them. And our hero sees a man tied naked to the mast of the pirate ship. And he's like, that's not on. He leaps across, he cuts him free. And they fight back to back, side by side, with one of them butt naked for the rest of the battle, which the author keeps telling us again and again and again and again. Um, so I'm guessing it's something that he's into. <laughs> um, anyway, once you've had your naked pirate fight, you're going to actually make it to the East Indies. You're going to become a good colonialist there. Um, you're gonna study, you're gonna work hard, you're gonna be a soldier. Um, then you're gonna come home, you're gonna discover that your dad's a French Duke who's been living well uh, in a well for 23 years, as you do. And this I think is possibly the pivotal step because that's when success arrives. So that's it guys, that's the easy way to become a hero of romance. Um, but despite all of these ridiculous adventures, what you're having here is this move through a journey where he's in eventually coming out and developing not a, a sort of very martial sense of masculinity, not a chivalric sense of masculinity, but using these kind of non-gendered virtue codes such as compassion and knowledge and emotional accessibility, etc. So you're getting again that sort of not quite the hero of sensibility, but um, connected to very similar values. So we've been talking about happy ever, happy ever afters at the moment, but we also need to address some transgressive affections. And we do see these in the um, early British Gothic. So when we talk about the Gothic, we often talk about fear and terror and transgression. Um, and we talk about transgression 
on this border between fear and desire for these transgressive things. And we see that quite frequently in the Gothic and we're already definitely seeing it in the 18th century, particularly as we move on to the horror Gothic. So I'm just gonna talk very quickly about two things here. The first are vampires, but we quite often now associate vampires with quite, um, quite queer positive identities. They're often either gender or sexuality fluid as characters. And we're sort of used to that um, representation of vampires now. But in the 18th century, with the first few vampire tales, that's not the story that we get. Um, so there was a vampire craze in Europe in the 18th century um, as, a, as a result of um, the Arnold Paul case, for example. And you had this filtering through to England and the first few um, representations of the vampire rely quite strongly, very much on the theological and philosophical grounding of these vampires. This idea of the dead as um, the damned walking. Um, you have Talaba the Destroyer by Robert Southey, you have the Geor by Byron, both of them include a little bit of vampirism. Um, you've also then got Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the Vampire by John Stagg. And in those two later poems, there's some very clearly queer coded sexuality going on. There's some very sapphic stuff going on with Christabel, as you can see in the background, as she's just about to take her clothes off and get into bed together. Um, but what you have here is not really with these vampires, I don't think that exploration of fear and desire so much as a repudiation, as a rejection of these queer sexualities. The vampire, this living dead man, this spiritually condemned uh, woman um, is very much kind of reflecting actually theologies of queerness and non-reproductive sexuality. This infectious death um, that's passed from one to another. There's no, there's no life being passed here. And you get this sense in Christabel that we have Geraldine, the vampiric figure, turns to Christabel just after the scene in the background here and says, with low voice and doleful look, in the touch of this bosom there worketh a spell which is lord of thy utterance, Christabel. So there's a sense here of the unwilling condemnation and the unwilling like infectious nature of this, the vampirism that Geraldine suffers from. And you find a very similar thing in John Stagg. So with these vampires at the moment, I don't think we're exploring that queer identity so much as rejecting it. Um, but obviously that's going to change for us in the 19th century. Um, there's another sort of model of transgression that we're finding, which is the transgressor pu punished. And I'm going to bring up two examples of that, which are very famous. Uh, the Monk by Matthew Lewis and The Floyer by Charlotte Dacker. As you can see from these two frontispieces from the two different novels, there are quite a lot of similarities between them. And so Floyer is often sort of considered to be the female version of the monk, sort of. So the monk is a story of a monk called Ambrosio um, who descends a path of vice ending up. Um, he starts off with lust and he ends up with incest, matricide, um, and just lots of murder, lots of crime. Um, and ends up uh, thrown down from the top of a cliff and rots for like several days before he dies. So that's gross. Um, Zafloya is a tale of Victoria Loredani, who is a very, uh, she knows what she wants and she explores female sexuality very uh, vigorously and strongly. So there are some queer coded um, transgressive desires that are, are found in these texts. In The Monk, um, this is mostly connected to the, the relationship that starts Ambrosio's descent into lust, which is with Rosario, a young novice at the monastery. But it turns out that he is actually uh, Matilda, a young woman disguised to enter the monastery. But then right at the end of the novel, we flip back and it was never, um, they were never either Rosario or Matilda. They are a, they're a demon. So not specifically gendered, and if gendered, masculine. Um, so what you're seeing here, I think, is some definite flexibility regarding both sex and gender, um, sexuality and gender. And you're also seeing um, an exploration of um, this sort of this valorization of this kind of homoerotic relationship between Rosario and Ambrosio. And of course, you've got this get out of jail free card in the text. You've got this, oh, 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 it's okay. He got punished. Don't worry about it. But you're definitely treading that line of fear and desire. 
with Zafloya, you have something, you have a couple of different things as well. So the object of Zafloya's, um, the object of Victoria's desire, she has multiple objects of desire, but one of them is Zafloya, who is actually the devil, but she thinks it's a, um, a Moorish servant. So you've got this idea of sort of mixed race attraction. And there are some very detailed, pretty sensual descriptions of Zafloya in there. And you also have this exploration of a very strong and demanding female sexuality. Um, another example, perhaps, of this exploration of transgressive desire is um, Bathek by William Beckford. And in all of these, you're getting the desires that are being explored. They are reflecting um, sort of parts of the extra fictional lives of their writers. So Charlotte Dacker um, was in was the mistress of her husband before she married him, for example. Matthew Lewis was a queer man. And William Beckford was uh, very well known as a queer man. There's also some really quite disturbing aspects of Bathek um, because it was written by William Beckford a year after he met William Courtney. Um, and there was a scandal when William Courtney was 18 um, and Beckford was, I think, 10 years older. Um, but they actually met when William Courtney was 10 and it was the year after that um, William Beckford wrote Bathick, including some very young children in it. Um, that nothing happened to them, um, but there's certainly this kind of valorization and sort of idolization going on. So this, the Gothic here is used to explore transgressive desires, but you have this perhaps self um, you have this self-reflexive um, attempt to disassociate from these desires, these transgressive desires. Okay, so break for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna have maybe five to 10 minutes, maybe a bit more, and you're going to be able to ask me any questions that you like. So just pop them in the chat and I will get to chatting to you. Oh, I don't want to see, thank you. Okay. There we go. Not you guys, sorry, I was talking to the Bing thing. I'm going to take one for the team and sleep with the demon. I think you probably have to queue up. Um, <laughs> hmm, interesting about the Sapphic writers of this period. I'll have to think about it. There's none that come to um, the top of my mind specifically, really clearly doing. Um, uh, exploring that, but I haven't read all the gothics that exist because there are hundreds of them. Um, you certainly see female authored texts that are definitely dwelling on feminine charms, uh, but yeah, I'll have a think and see if I can think of any more obvious ones. I mean, obviously somebody's mentioned it. The most obvious one is Carmilla, but again, written by a man. Um, I'm not going to specifically be talking much about Carmilla. Um, it's going to come up in the second uh, section, but I am going to do another class later on on vampires. So Carmilla's obviously going to get chucked in there. And I think you definitely see with Carmilla, there's um, a different exploration going on of um, sexuality. There's, you've got a change from the 18th to the 19th century vampire because you're moving further and further away from these kind of theological roots of conceiving of the vampire. Do I think Victor Frankenstein was a deliberate critique of the masculine Gothic hero, perhaps because of Shelley's mother's work? Okay, so um, I'm gonna get to Frankenstein in the next section. Um, and it's, it's slightly different because what you've got here is the Byronic hero, um, rather than this kind of hero of sensibility and this, and this Gothic hero per se, you're, you're, you're getting that move into dark romanticism. But yes, definitely it's a critique of that hero. And I don't think you even need to go to um, the work of Mary Wollstonecraft as you do to Mary Shelley's life experience with her husband, um, Percy Shelley, who you can quite easily read into Victor Frankenstein. Um, but there is certainly this, this critique of these monstrous overreaches, um, creative overreaches as well. Why the emergence of female writers? Did they want to portray females differently than the male authors were? I mean, it's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of factors that are going into this and there's a lot of factors such as um, the increases in literacy, which are hard to, um, 
actually calculate, but you've also got um, things such as the circulating libraries and the um, increased access to text. So you're changing the face of who is reading and what they're reading about. And so who is um, dominating the literary market. So novels like the Gothics were associated with both female readers and female writers and this absolute boom in female reading, um, theoretically. Um, so I think you're getting a sense of uh, catering to that market, but you're also getting with the Gothic, you have what is considered to be a sort of lower class literature or not high brow, a low brow literature or a middle brow literature. Well, they really have necessarily those definitions, but this sort of more low brow literature. So um, it's not as closed to, to women. And you were also getting some trailblazers who were really opening the way. And you've also got to think of things like increasing female literacy and access to education. Um, but I mean, it's not just the Gothic, of course, you've got writers, a lot of those writers in the 18th century, some of the most famous ones were women, because the novel as a form um, was one which was, um, to a great extent, really, women were, were central to developing the novel as a form and claiming it as their own before men got in there. So if you read Ian Watts, The Rise of the Novel, he concentrates almost completely on male writers. But if you look at the history and development of the novel and writers that were selling effectively during the 18th century and even uh, at the end of the 17th century, you're starting to see some really interesting uh, rises in women writers, women writers that are kind of paving the way and, and making these changes. So, for example, with the Gothic, you see it was Clara Reeve that got in there and said, no, Walpole's is too ridiculous. We need to change it to a more probable kind of supernatural. Um, so hopefully that's answered your question a bit. Do feel free to um, ask for further clarification. I think it's a really complex question and there's lots of different factors going into it. Uh, could Richardson's novels have encouraged a greater focus on the inner, inner experiences of female characters? Yes, I think they could. <laughs> um, but it's not, or it's not even necessarily a sort of move to focalization through the point of view of the heroine that, that we get with these female writers. We're just getting a different kind of heroinism. So if you're thinking about um, Clarissa or Pamela, what you're getting is a novel of resistance, usually passive virtuous resistance. And you've still got that going on in the Gothic, but you also have um, in Ellen Moyer's words, you've got these traveling heroines, um, heroines who are, who are out there exploring, exploring their curiosity, um, discovering for themselves, literally just traveling as well. So it's, it's more about maybe the possibilities that were increasingly being explored of what women were doing in these fictions. More sensibility non-gendered from the get-go and are there at least some subtle differences in the expectations of the sensible woman and the sensible man? Yes, so I would say earlier on, the debate about sensibility was more non-gendered than it was um, at sort of towards the end of the cult of sensibility because it was all part of some really important th philosophical discussions going on um, about the connection between emotion and morality, for example, and ethics, the work of people like Shaftesbury, um, Hume, Hutchison. And um, it became increasingly a gendered conception. But I think for me, that's something that's interesting about these Gothic novels, because um, they're women taking this code that is still perhaps being more um, rigorously enforced upon them and they're applying it more universally. They're going back to this idea of it as non-gendered value. And there's also an interesting kind of conception of um, a lot of the qualities of sensibility also match onto the Christian hero or the Christian, um, the fruits of the spirit, for example, uh, patience, gentleness, meekness. So they're going for these uh, sets of values which were originally kind of associated uh, no, with a non-gendered conception. Um, but yes, as it goes on, it becomes more gendered and it becomes sort of, I think what Mary Wollstonecraft in the, the Rights of Women is really rebelling against is the way in which sensibility is used to control and limit what a woman does and is responsible for doing. So men who show sensibility are valued, but men are also valued for productivity, martial valor, etc. Whereas sensibility is used as was was being used perhaps as one of the chief, if not the chief model of virtue and behavior for women. 
and um, according to Mary Wollstonecraft, it's something that was infantilizing them because this emphasis on, on feeling and sentiment and this idea that you'll know what's right um, diminished the um, diminished all of the the other things that women could be doing. It diminished an emphasis on productivity, on the increase in knowledge, on working, uh, not working outside the home, but being outside the home, just having a life um, divorced or separated from a very limited sphere of, of potential actions. Um, I think you've also got this idea that with women, it became attached to things like child rearing. And then you're getting these gendered conceptions of, well, women are more suited to it, et cetera. Um, and that's all because they're more emotional. So you're getting increasingly gendered. I'm not an academic, just a fan of Gothic romances um, and modern spins, but my favorite's Wuthering Heights. Is it a Gothic romance, correct? And Heathcliff is an anti-hero. Okay, so don't worry. I'm going to get on to Wuthering Heights in the next section. But yes, it's definitely a Gothic novel. And I would say he is an anti-hero slash villain because um, I don't like Heathcliff. And I'm really sorry if about five of you log off right now. Um, are there any other questions or shall I begin the second part? You're very welcome to ask more questions. <gasps> Currently reading Wuthering Heights. It's very good. I love Wuthering Heights, but I don't read it as a romance. Yep, agree. <laughs> so Heathcliff was a useless something there in the, uh, in the chat. By the way, I'm drinking hot chocolate, so feeling very academic and uh, professional right now. Anyway. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to go on to the second bit and we're going to go into romanticism and into the 19th century. Ooh, another question. Okay. Did the queer content or undercurrent in the Gothic romance rise as society's opin opinions of homosexuality grew more punitive from the 18th to the 19th century? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's a problem here with the presumption that the opinions of homosexuality grew more punitive in a very straight line from the 18th to the 19th centuries. Um, I think there's certainly a move to sort of change the way that the laws are phrased, et cetera, in the 19th century, but there's still a widespread condemnation and rejection of, for example, sodomy, which was a crime that was used, a name for a crime that was used to describe all forms of transgressive sexuality of the period. Um, so, I think in a way what you're getting is in the 19th century, the conception of what um, homosexuality was, was changing. So you have in the 18th century, um, probably most of you are aware of this, uh, of this sort of difference that in the 18th century, homosexuality as an identity or bisexuality or pansexuality, these weren't identities. Um, it was more about what you did. So the laws, and the way of describing it was connected to actions that you took. Um, so the actions themselves selves were still just as rigorously condemned. And you've got the, oh my gosh, what is it? The, the reform of public manners people in the 18th century. So you had this like, immense crackdown on like the molly houses in the 18th century and these rigorous crusades, these moralistic crusades. Um, and when you get things like, um, Sorry. Uh, yeah, you're getting the rise of evangelical Christianity starting in the 18th century, and that's impacting and um, the 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 view and relationship of homosexuality um, or queer identities, and and causing more rejection of them. So it's really difficult to say about development. But what you're getting in the Gothic in terms of depiction, I think, is you have very clearly in the vampire you have a change from condemnation to a slight more bit of exploration and titillating exploration there, um, titillating investigation. Um, and you also have, obviously, by the end of the 19th century, you're getting um, novels with a queer subtext where that's not the subject of punishment in the text, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers your question, but hopefully it's covered a couple of um, ideas and, and questions there. I've just, I saw a question just go past. Oh, 
whether the gothic became a way for the gay community to express itself it's a really interesting question and um i think in a sense yes um why because the gothic is a way to um explore transgressive um desires and realities and when your uh, sexual or gender identity is considered transgressive, then a mode like the Gothic becomes an ideal mode for at least expressing, exploring, or depicting that, basically. Is it too much to speak? No, go for it. Um, I'm gonna go now into the um, second part. So we're gonna have covered a couple of bits already in the questions, but let's get going. So, a ver, a ver. There we go. So you should all be able to see my uh, sexy vampire screen now. And moving on. No, oh, no, not quite moving on. <laughs> there we go. So um, towards the end of the um, 18th century, we're also moving into the Romanticism period. And there's a lot of overlap between the Gothic and Romanticism because although the Gothic started in 1764, its heyday was the 1790s, which is when you're really seeing the development of Romanticism through like the treaties of Wordsworth and Coleridge, etc. Um, but one of the big changes is in the dark Romanticism of writers such as Byron, and this introduction of the Byronic hero or anti-hero. Um, now, I'm going to make a distinction here. I don't like to use the term Byronic hero outside of um, this sort of historicized context because it's become a term that we're using very vaguely with very little meaning. When I'm talking about more modern romances, I'm going to talk about a dark hero and explain what I mean by that. But right at this moment, we're looking at the roots of the Byronic hero and what goes into a Byronic hero. So how to tell if you're a Byronic hero. These characteristics I've taken from a writer called Peter Thorslev, who was writing in 1962, and um, his name is on the bibliography. And he, d he kind of investigates and describes the different threads and existing heroic types or villainous types that went into the Byronic hero. So a Byronic hero is going to be, to some extent, a hero of sensibility, open to emotions um, and quite a lot about sort of feeling. Um, he's going to be a man of extreme feelings, um, so the high, he has more emotional range and depth than the average man. He's not like other men. Um, a gloomy egoist, so very concerned with the self, but also very self-critical and often self-damning. They're quite this idea of the noble outlaw, so you're a renegade and a rebel against an oppressive societal structure. You might be a child of nature, so there's um, just like the hero of sensibility, you're probably going to enjoy walking about in the mountains, gazing off into the distance. And there's elements of sort of the gothic villainy. Most of these Byronic heroes either have, they don't just have a tragic past, but they have a criminal past. They've committed great crimes. So if you think of some of the most famous Byronic heroes written by Byron himself, you've got people like Manfred, um, the Gior and the Corsair. And they've all got crimes to their names, for example, of murder, or in the case of Manfred, like summoning demons for profane knowledge. You've also got this sense that the Byronic hero is borrowing from specific prototype characters. And one of these is obviously Lucifer. Now this is quite interesting. Um, it's, there's this re-reading of Lucifer and particularly of John Milton's Lucifer in Paradise Lost in the Romantic Period. So John Milton's theology um, is somewhat heterodox, but his depiction of the devil is largely orthodox in terms of the underlying theology. And so in book one of Paradise Lost, you get this quasi-heroic figure, but it becomes undone throughout the rest of the books of the poem. And he's revealed to be vicious and petty. Um, and so you have sort of a fairly standard demonic God relationship being described there. But um, in the Romantic period, you have this reimagining of Satan in the work of writers such as uh, Lord Byron, uh, William Godwin, the Shelleys, uh, Percy Shelley particularly, and this idea of Lucifer as this grand rebel against an unfair God or against oppressive structures. There's also the influence of the Cain model. If you don't know Cain, he was the first murderer, killed his brother Abel. Um, and the punishment for that was eternal exile. So part of this Byronic um, identity is they are also exiled or separate from normal society. There's also the influence of the Prometheus myth. So 
Prometheus was the titan that stole fire from the gods. And for that crime, he was strapped to a rock and an eagle came and ate his liver every day um, for eternity. So Prometheus in the period, if you're thinking about um, the Byron and Shelley works particularly, is associated with creativity, um, but also with overreaching and defiance again. And then you have the Faust figure, the man who made a deal with Mephistopheles for, for life and knowledge and power. And again, this is an overreacher, wanting to reach beyond the possibilities of society and beyond the limits of humanity. So this is what we find in the Byronic hero. So you're a rebel, you're an overreacher, you're tragically misunderstood, you're of a different order to other men, um, and you're a renegade. So what do you get for that? What kind of love do you get? I bet you can see from the background that it's going to be a great happy story that we're getting here. Nope, death. So um, this picture is taken from Frankenstein. Um, and so somebody was asking about Frankenstein. And what you get in Victor Frankenstein is quite clearly a type of Byronic hero um, who is defying uh, God and nature to create life himself. I mean, it's called the modern Prometheus as well. So it's obviously borrowing from that Promethean myth. Um, he's a gloomy egoist, always thinking about himself and condemnating himself, condemning himself, um, a hero of sensibility and extreme emotions, child of nature, etc., etc., etc. And he also conceives of himself as a noble outlaw, working outside of the path of science. But what we find here is obviously he marries Elizabeth and then she dies, killed by the creature that he has created. What we find with the Byronic hero is that their loves don't work. They always have these tragic amours. So there's a couple of, there's lots of different reasons for this. One of them is it doesn't really go with the Byronic pose. You can't end up married to the love of your life, happy, like in a wee semi-detached house with two kids, um, a dog and a job in a factory. You know, like, that's not the way it works for a Byronic hero. But there's also this sense that the Byronic hero feels themselves to be um, unworthy of love and incapable of inspiring love, or not in, of inspiring love, but incapable of sustaining love, and also that the love that they have is self-destructive and destroys those around them. So there's also a sense that the type of love associated with the Byronic hero is inherently um, impossible. So the Byronic hero looks to the female equivalent of the female object of desire as his salvation but it's a salvation that can't work. So she's on a pedestal, she's far away. The picture here is again from Demon by Lermontov. And as I mentioned at the beginning, what happens when he persuades her to love him and he kisses her is that she dies immediately. And it's quite a good illustration of this, the way in which the move down from the pedestal in order to love the Byronic criminal is a move of corruption that ultimately destroys um, the object of, uh, of veneration. You've also got, um, so somebody also mentioned Wuthering Heights. And I think in Wuthering Heights, you find another type of Byronic hero, certainly in the way that the love works. So Heathcliff isn't like the aristocratic, um, uh, courtly, half courtly um, heroes of Byron himself. But you have this sense of the gloomy egoist. You have this sense of the, the rebel, the exile, um, the one who doesn't fit. And once again, his love turns into a form of destruction, both for himself and the woman that he loves. So um, before I go on to how that Byronic hero became taken and adapted for the romance by the Brontes, I want to just quickly mention um, the first Byronic vampire. Because the first Byronic vampire, or the first Byronesque vampire, was an anti-Byronic vampire. So the, the, the vampire, the first vampire short story is written by William Polidori. It was a result, of course, of that famous evening at the Via Diodati and the ghost story telling competition where Shelley and Shelley and Byron and uh, Polidori, they all had this competition going forward. Um, obviously, Mary Shelley ended up writing Frankenstein. Byron started writing a vampire story, Augustus Deverell, but never finished it. You can actually find the fragment in a copy of Mazeppa, um, and you can find that on archive.org, or you can look at some of the links that I've uh, been putting in my read-alongs. Um, and he never finished. William Polidori's story was garbage, so he threw his away, and he finished the vampire story. But what he did was create a vampire that was very similar to Byron, 
He used the name Lord Ruthven, which was the name that Lady Caroline Lamb had given to her Byron character in the Romana Clef takedown of Byron. Um, and he also included details from Byron's life. So he creates a vampire that is very clearly Byron, but he reveals both the Byronic pose and the Byronic identity to be inherently corrupt and terrible. So this isn't a sexy Byronic vampire in a sense. Not, it's not meant to attract the reader. It's meant to repulse the reader. We're told that his character was dreadfully vicious. And the possession of irresistible powers of seduction actually only made it worse. Um, and this idea as well that he acquired to enhance his gratifications that his victim, the partaker of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. So this idea of this particular Byronic or anti-Byronic vampire being one of corruption and defilement. So it's not a celebration of the Byronic. It's not this turn to the Byronic as hero or anti-hero of romance. Where we get that is, of course, in the Brontes. So in the Brontes, we see the romance and the Gothic meeting once again on equal terms to some extent. And what we find here is the this, this changing and shaping of the Byronic hero into something different. Now, this is where I'm, I'm going to start using the term dark hero. So what is the dark hero? It might have quite a lot of Byronic qualities, but this is a hero that is basically one who needs to be redeemed, not only saved by this angelic other, but redeemed and changed and tamed. Um, but he also needs to be saved from his own tragic past. So... The Byronic um, hero is, is often defined by his crimes. Um, the dark hero isn't guiltless, but there is a path towards uh, change. And there's a sense that he was good really, but he followed a bad path. He married a mad wife, for example. Um, so if you're not familiar with Jane Eyre, which I'm presuming most of you are familiar with Jane Eyre, um, it's a governess, Jane Eyre. She goes to uh, Thornfield and she meets the master of the house, Mr. Rochester. Uh, there's love, etc. I've given you all the Rochesters there so you don't feel slighted based on whatever your favourite is. Timothy Dalton. Um, and then um, reveals that he's got a hidden wife in the attic. Um, Jane runs away. <laughs> and, but in the end, it all works out. Love abounds, etc., etc. And he has been to some extent tamed. So this idea of the dark hero is sort of the... the the key, the key hero of the Gothic romance really starts with Jane Eyre. We often think of him as being a Bronte hero, but it's worth distinguishing between the different types of Bronte hero and the different types of love relationship that we find in their novels. So we've already mentioned a little bit about Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights. He's a more sort of traditionally Byronic hero in many senses, with a tragic love that can't um, save anyone. So I would argue that Emily Bronte has a much more um, cynical and problematic relationship with the idea of love. It's not something that can save in her works, neither the hero nor the heroine. It's not a, a secular scripture. Um, it's a Northup Fry term, but it's not the secular, it's not the secular scripture of the novel because Kathy can't escape with it in, in any direction. The love that she has with Heathcliff is one which erases her and consumes her until she's on the point of saying, I am Heathcliff. Her love for Edgar Linton, on the other hand, represses her and the expressions of her personality. So love offers no exit from the societal position of the woman in the period. Um, the other novel that I'm gonna mention is um, Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And in Anne Bronte, you see more clearly, I would argue, just a rejection of this Byronic hero, a rejection of the dark hero. The heroine, Helen, she leaves her drunken, abusive, byronic -y husband, um, sets up on her own as an artist and ends up with Gilbert. Um, so you have this move towards what I would term the quiet hero. So if the dark hero represents the threat of the novel to some extent, needs redemption, and is part of the darkness of the text, the quiet hero just usually fairly unambiguously opposes that darkness. He offers an alternative and an alternative version of love is offered as well. One that's kind of more based on equality of um, relationship. Um, there are also, of course, in the 19th century, many, many novels which aren't 
specifically romances, but which include these romance subplots, just like in the 18th century. And I think here we're beginning to see where the servant hero went. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, we've got these new type of heroes here. They're not aristocratic anti-heroes. They're not byron -esque. They're not dark heroes. They're not heroes of sensibility, um, weeping around the place all the time and being useless. They're useful. They legitimately rescue or help to rescue um, or help to survive the women um, with, which, with whom they are in love. So I've picked um, Walter Harkwright there, the artist in The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, a sensation novel. And he is um, of a lower social class, but he also goes through the journey that she partakes with her. So there's, there's all sorts of adventures that go on with um, doubled identities and um, being forcibly sent to a madhouse and people taking your inheritance, etc. Um, and his form of heroism involves walking through that with the heroine. With Jonathan Harker in Dracula, the lawyer's clerk, you have again this sort of return to a lower class her hero, um, not lower class, but of a sort of lower middle class or middle class hero. Um, there's no sense of this sort of ability to rescue and save and elevate um, the heroine. But there is this sense of facing a danger together and this move towards um, what we find in some 19th century novels, the rational hero who's using tools such as train timetables and uh, recording equipment to defeat the evil of the novels. Um, and these relationships are by their very nature to some extent more equal. They're exploring some of the changing gender relationships that you're getting within the Victorian period. Now somebody asked about Carmilla, um, still a bit come, we still got a bit of Carmilla here. Um, transgression, does that still get explored in the 19th century? Of course it does. And it's getting, uh, it's sort of taking over more, especially in that decadent period at the end of the 19th century with novels like Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Picture of Dorian Gray and Carmilla. And there's transgressive desires being explored, queer sexualities, polyamory and um, Dracula, debauchery, decadence, promiscuity, female sexuality, adultery and deviance, um, which can be all of the above or something else. Um, and in these texts, you're getting these explorations and often these condemnations. So for example, obviously in Dracula, you have Lucy Westermar being straked very dramatically for her daring to have sort of sexual thoughts. Um, but you also are sometimes getting a more neutral representation of queer identity in, um, for example, the picture of Dorian Gray. Now, obviously, Dorian Gray, not so much, but um, Basil, for example. Um, the, the sort of uh, affectionate um, interest that he has in Dorian Gray is obviously queer coded, but it's not um, depicted as inherently negative. So um, you're, you're starting to see it... Um, queer representation slipping through into these novels in different ways, not only as a sort of transgression that is um, explicitly punished by the text. Okay, so boom, end of the second part. Um, I'm going to stop sharing again and take a couple of questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, then please do ask. I know I've got some Victorianists in the room, so don't smash me to pieces. What does the female character type most closely connected to the Byronic hero in the 19th century? Where do we ever see women who are unruly, brooding, highly emotional in this particular way? Hmm, it's a really good question, actually. Um, you've already got some of them appearing in Gothic texts um, as these sort of monstrous women. Um, so I don't think you don't tend to get these women depicted as um, from that sort of positive, semi-positive perspective that you get for the Byronic hero, which is, you know, often a form of self-representation. Um, so for example, um, an example of that sort of monstrous woman would be in The Floyer by um, Charlotte Dacker. Um, but she is roundly punished by the text um, for being unruly and brooding and highly emotional. So I think there is, um, yeah, in sanatoriums as cautionary tales, these women, I can't really think of an example where they don't get punished by the text, but if anyone can, then do feel free to pop one in.
it's not the same as the way in which Byronic heroes sort of fail or end tragically. They sort of die. They usually die tragically defying God or something, you know, shaking their fist at demons, um, not just kind of like thrown in a, in an asylum. Um, what does the super, oh my gosh, what a question. What does the supernatural represent in Gothic novels? That's a big one. Um, a really big one. Um, it's something that I'm going to cover a little bit more when I do the ones that are specifically about um, different supernatural manifestations. So I'm going to do one on demonic representation. I'm going to do one on ghosts. I'm going to do one on vampires. But I think the answer um, is not is not very helpful. But the supernatural, um, particularly in different periods and different manifestations, is functioning in different ways and meaning different things. Um, so it can it can range from uh, being largely allegorical, so the ghosts represent you know the past that won't die, um, to representing complex theological arguments about the nature of um, of the human soul. So it can be a lot of different things, and it really depends on the writer themselves and their theological and philosophical position in relation to the contemporary debates about supernatural manifestations. Um, as I say, I can go into that a lot in a lot more detail, for example, when we talk about ghosts. Do, 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 do. Let me see. New game. Was there a lot of connections between aesthetic movements? You mentioned that there are certain aspects that pop up novels that are decadent, but there is more clear connections between the wider movements. I mean, I think it depends what you mean by aesthetic movements. Um, if you're thinking literary movements or, or movements that were also literary, so like um, the decadent movement at the end of the 19th century was both literary and aesthetic more generally, of course. Um, you, you're always getting um, connections between them. They're always bleeding into each other and they're always interrelated. So that we see, for example, with the Gothic and the Rome, Roman, and the romance, romantic, romanticism, mm, sorry, um, although there's often a distinction between them, we can quite clearly see the relationship between, for example, the Gothic villain and the Byronic anti-hero. So they're usually both a reaction to and a building on previous models, I would say, if that answers your question. Think about Lucy and Dracula. Do you think any of Lucy's suitors have connections to Gothic and Romance archetypes? Yeah, I mean, I think quite a few of them are actually connected to um, that sort of rational hero, so like Seaward. Um, you've got the aristocratic um, lover in Arthur, is that his name? But who can't save her, interestingly. Uh, the interesting one for me has always been, is it Quincy, the American? Um, and the fact that, that he gets killed. So I suppose that sort of masculinity is rejected. But I think it's potential. It's weird because Bram Stoker was uh, quite, it's obviously valorizing that form of masculinity in the text because he's the one that comes across best. And we know that Bram Stoker had this interest in America. Um, but yeah, he he dies for some reason. He's the one who um who he's the one who gets killed, he's the one who gets rejected. So it's quite an interesting um move that. You, you, you. So the Byronic hero versus dark heroes, would you say love is redemption or not is the main defining quality? Not entirely. I think dark hero for me is just a much more general term. So Byronic heroes are also dark heroes to a certain extent. But if you're differentiating between them, I think that idea of redemption versus salvation um, is quite a useful um, sort of way of dif differentiating between them. Because this idea of the Byronic hero is looking to this unattainable female object as a form of salvation to sort of purify him. Whereas with the dark hero, that, that sort of thing can occur, particularly in a very simplified narrative, but you're also looking at um, him changing, um, him being redeemed and working towards change. So I think that is quite a useful distinction between them personally. Um, okay, so from an undergrad thesis advisor that Heathcliff is a kind of vampire, do I think that's supported by the text at all? I mean, literally, as a vampire, not really. Um, but I think if you're looking at vampiric tropes, then sure, like he sucks the life out of everybody um, and is this sort of devouring consumer of life around him. And there is certainly, like, he, I think he's called in the text, isn't it? At one point, it uses the word vampire about him. Am I wrong? Does somebody Google search it in Wuthering Heights with me? Um, I think there's definitely that imagery that it's, it's applied, but it's more applied as a sort of um, metaphor. 
for him. And you can think about his vampirism as a kind of metaphoric representation of the way in which he does um, feed off those around him and consume them. Um, you, 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 you. I heard it. Okay. Um, a Victorianist here. Oh no, you mentioned the quiet hero or rational hero. Would we say that there are female representations of these type of hero? Um, I mean, yeah, definitely. You're getting different types of female heroine. Obviously, the big change in the at the end of the Victorian period is that the new woman um, and this move towards heroines that are of themselves much more practical, um, much more sort of active um, and less gendered to a certain extent. So I think definitely you do. Yes, you're seeing a progress progress being made as well in terms of the representation of heroines um, that mirror these changes in uh, the masculine hero. The, the male heroes. In, in terms of the quiet hero and the quiet heroine, somebody like Marion Holcomb would be the female equivalent to a certain extent of something like the quiet hero, I think. Um, so practical, self-effacing, not the romantic heroine necessarily of the text. Um, where do you see the idea of redemption of the hero coming from? Do you see any connection with such earlier unredeemed villain heroes as Lovelace, Valmont and Don Giovanni? Um, yeah, definitely. I think there's a really clear line between these these um, these villains that you get in like the melodrama and in um, the Jacobean theatre and you get in uh, the Gothic. And there's this very clear line between how these villains developed. And it's I think it's a question to some extent of complexity because you're getting this move away from sort of cardboard cutout villains into increasingly complex depictions of their subjectivity, which almost inevitably moves us towards um, sympathy and, and, and the kind of concept of the anti-hero. I know Joseph Crawford has also um, kind of talked about the way in which as society um, changes and opens up to different conceptions and has less rigorous or just changing boundaries about what is inside and what is outside, who's an insider and an outsider, then um, these different sort of villainous characters will be changing position in relation to those changing lines of who's villainous, etc. cetera. Um, I think a really good example of this and how this developed, you can see it in the work of Anne Radcliffe, because you move, excuse me, from um, the very black and white villains of a Sicilian romance in the castles of Athens and Umbane, and um, even to some extent uh, of, of the romance of the forest, towards the very attractive villain of the mysteries of Udolf, who is nonetheless just killed. And then in the Italian, the, one of the main characters is basically the villain Scadoni, and he's much more well developed and much more intriguing as a character. And once you've already built that, the next obvious step is to work on a text where that character becomes more central and you're going on his journey with him. Okay, I'm gonna have to um, stop answering questions. Quincy, there we go. Um, so his legacy lives on, Stoker has an interest in, yeah, he does, he has an interest in American war women. Salvation rather than Richard Fink, not a big, no. <laughs> um, Mina is definitely a new woman, check. Um, well, I mean, yeah, Jay, I think that's an, an interesting idea. Jane Eyre as well. Um, you're talking about this uh, version of heroism, which is much more kind of uh, related to that rational hero, the practical heroine, the practical hero. Okay, is he a ghoul or a vampire? I'm used. I had heard of such hideous incarnate demons in Wuthering Heights. Yeah, so it is in the text, but it's a metaphorical representation, I would argue. Um, so there we go. I'm at the end of the list. I'm starting to talk super quickly because I'm aware we need to get onto the next bit. Um, so we're going to move now into the 20th century. So come with me on an exciting journey to the 20th century. Um, okay, so at the beginning <coughs> of the 20th century, we have again um, this move into um, combining, like in the Brontes, where the Gothic and the Romance um, are sort of equal parts of um, a book. Now, getting into sort of gothic romance territory and the really obvious writer who really spread the popularity of this trend uh, this popularity of this mix is uh, Daphne du Maurier um, in two of her famous works we're going to start with Rebecca and Rebecca is quite obviously looking back to and, and working with that Jane Eyre narrative but Daphne du Maurier has always been a lot more suspicious and critical of love 
um, than Charlotte Bronte, where she's kind of more following on in Emily Bronte's shoes. And you certainly see that in the differences between the Jane Eyre narrative and the Rebecca narrative. So similarly in both, you have um, a female heroine from a lower social position entering a new social situation. Jane's a governess, and the unnamed heroine of Rebecca was a companion who then becomes a wife. Uh, there's a, dis a distant aristocratic male in both, and both of the houses that they move into are haunted to some extent um, by a previous wife. So in the case of Jane Eyre, this is a living wife who haunts the house with her cries, um, who's been locked in the attic. And in um, Rebecca, it's the murdered first wife, but who also dominates the house through her personality. And through, if you can see in the picture, Mrs. Danvers there, who's sort of like her avatar. Um, but you have, I think, some major differences here in how the love relationships develop and work out. So when Jane realizes about the wife in the attic, she runs. She gets out and she says, nope, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, on, in contrast, the unnamed heroine um, of Rebecca stays. So Jane is there asserting, I'm a free human being with an independent will. So she retains her autonomy apart from Rochester and refuses to give away um, all measure of equality. As she's been, like during his courtship, she's been saying, no, I'm not going to play the beggar maid to your King Capetua. Um, but in contrast, you have the heroine in Rebecca. She sort of boasts, no clash of thought or of opinion makes a barrier between us. So she is sort of subsuming herself within the, within the identity of Max de Winter, her husband. So in both, the house burns. In Jane Eyre, this house burning is a moment of freedom, um, in a sense. So the house burning, it destroys some of the barriers between him. And also because of the physical damage it does to Rochester, it creates um, a lesser degree of inequality between them and how much they need each other and rely on each other, etc. Um, with Rebecca, on the other hand, the house burning down traps the two protagonists in a sort of meaningless life, uh, circulating between hotels, almost frozen in the trauma of the past. So you have these different representations, but this sort of rejection or suspicion of this love narrative and the idea of a Byronic hero or a dark hero who turns out to be exactly what the heroine needs and is looking for, um, that's not necessarily what is then taken from um, Daphne du Maurier and becomes so popular and influential in the 20th century. So Daphne du Maurier, um, and particularly the uh, Orwell version of the film, really impacted the paranoid women's film um, in the sort of beginning mid, well, mid 20th century. Um, but also the rise of the gothics or the gothic novel. So by gothics, um, we're talking about the mass market paperbacks, which really rose to prominence in the 60s and 70s. Um, they existed before and they've existed after, um, but that's where they really sort of rose to immense popularity. And what um, the book is often sort of quoted as starting that trend is Mistress of Melon by Victoria Holt. Now, there's often a conception in critical literature that there's a formula to these gothics. And I'm just going to straight up tell you that I disagree. Um, I think that the production of this formula is actually really harmful both to criticism and appreciation of gothic romances. But <laughs> we're going to go through it first. And it is a helpful guide to some of the key features that you will quite often find in um, gothic romances. So this definition is taken from a critic called Joanna Russ, who wrote a very coolly titled article called Somebody's Trying to Kill Me and I Think It's My Husband. Um, and she argues that the requisite ingredients are an inexperienced heroine, a la Jane Eyre, um, moving to a large lonely house in an exotic country, like Jane Eyre. Um, I'm not going to keep saying like Jane Eyre, but you can just add like Jane Eyre to all of them. Um, usually an orphan with an absent uh, mother and father, but sometimes with a wicked mother figure. There's going to be a dark, magnetic, powerful, brooding, sardonic super male, um, a Rochester, a dark hero, um, an aristocratic lord. There'll be another woman, usually a first wife or a rival, one or more buried ominous secrets. Quite often, not always, there's going to be like a young girl or a young child who um, the heroine has to look after to show her like momming skills. Um, there's a possible shadow male. So he's a guy who looks to be perfect on paper. Everything's going so great. Um, but he turns out to be like a murderer every single time. Um, you've also got ominous dialogue, obvs, um, and an inevitable untangling at the end, which allows for the happy ending. So... 
this idea of there being a formula or a recipe, part of that um, is due, I would argue, to some of the class and gender biases which still occur in criticism and the way in which romance is often dif disregarded and viewed as formulaic and uh, not appreciated for the particularity of, of its form. Um, but also because the publishing of mass market paperbacks um, and particularly within specific genres tends to homogenize the production of how they're sold at the very least, because you're, you're aiming at a, an existing audience who are looking perhaps for certain um, ingredients or things that they're wanting. So, I mean, you can potentially um, think about this in relation to, uh, what's it called? The things on AO3 can't remember but um i'm sure somebody said but i can't read it in the chat at the moment i'm sorry um but where you, you know what you're looking for and so they're identifying the book as a gothic romance by using fairly um similar techniques so you've got the very famous of course covers um the woman with perfect hair running away from a house as scantily clad as possible if you please um, and you'll see it looming over here in the background. So that it creates this sense of homo homogeneity or of sameness. You've also got the blurbs because the blurbs on the back are always trying to hit the marks that people are looking for or hit the marks that identify this generic category. So here on the back, I've, I've uh, highlighted them for you. It points to this idea of love, the innocent heroine, the sardonic super male, the threat, the isolated house, the buried ominous secret. And so this is how we're getting this idea of a formula that's repeating. And it's fair to say that quite a lot of the Gothics had some similar elements, but is there such a thing as a Gothic formula? No. Um, what, we ha what we find if we have a Gothic formula is that we're distorting our understanding of what these books are and, and what they can be. We're erasing differences between authors and texts. And we're also diminishing the readers who read them, saying, oh, you're just reading the same book hundreds of times. <laughs> you must be an idiot. Um, that's sort of, for me, quite often what I hear when I'm reading that sort of criticism. Um, but we can deconstruct it quite critically um, by looking at certain aspects. So for example, different writers have different emphases, settings, concerns, and tropes. If you're familiar with Phyllis Whitney and Victoria Holt, they're two of the most famous writers of gothics. And they write really quite different novels. So Victoria Holt's novels are usually set in a historical period. A lot of them were set very famously in Cornwall, or they got more exotic um, as she, she went on. Phyllis Whitney, in, in contrast, often sets her novels in a more contemporary period. Um, she also focuses on um, an independent, often working heroine. And there's a difference between the heroes in Victoria Holt. It's almost always the dark um, brooding sonic super male, admittedly. But in Phyllis Whitney, you quite often find quiet heroes. So in the Trembling Hills, for example, the hero there, Philip, is described um, by the little girl who has an irritating habit of describing everybody as a sort of food. She describes him as white bread because he's the blandest man ever. Um, you also have these different emphases. So in that formula, we have this idea that there's this one other woman and the relationship between the women is centered on the male figure. Whereas in Victoria Holt, there's usually multiple female figures all in different interrelationships with each other. And it's these relationships which often form the core concerns of the text. Um, with Phyllis Whitney, similarly, it can be um, interpersonal relations between women which form the key um, problem. So in The Trembling Hills, it's largely about her relationship to her aunt and the money that could be coming to her and how it's changing her, etc. So you can see already that we're moving away from the formulas and the way they distort our understanding of the text. Um, of course, there's an exception to every rule. So for everything that's on that list, you can find one or many books that don't conform to it. As I've noted, there's more than one type of hero. There's quite often the quiet hero as well as the dark hero. And as the book on the whatever side of the screen that is for you, The Picture by Laurie A. Page, she wrote um, a couple of years ago, last year, The Gothic Romance Wave. And she explores how the genre developed over time in quite useful ways. It's quite a good introductory guide to the Gothic romance as a genre. Um, she talks about, for example, the fact that sex became... Uh, more of a part of the gothic romances as you're moving out of the 70s and into the 80s that increasingly there were paranormal components um, including of course this move from the gothic romance hero into the vampire 
um, and you're you're moving a little bit into paranormal romance through, for example, Dark Shadows and Barnaby Collins and through then Anne Rice and Anita Blake, etc. You're moving into new genres and this gothic anti-hero is becoming the paranormal super, um, super male. Um, you're also getting a move away from the incredibly heteronormative uh, nature of the the the, re the recipe itself and, the, and many of the earlier texts towards queer texts like Gaywick, um, where the main character is called Gaylord Gaywick, just in case you weren't sure that he was gay. It's in every part of his name. Um, but you're getting this move away so that the Gothic uh, romance is developing and changing over time. Of course, because you're not going to get readers that are reading the same story um, ad nauseum, ad infinitum. Um, the most important thing that I want to talk about today is the fact that there were other intersections of the Gothic and romance apart from the Gothics themselves and from this sort of Jane Eyre style um, of text or uh, text. So does, a, does a, a romance novel have to be Gothic to be Gothic? To be, does it have to be a Gothic to be Gothic? No, creepy puppet thing. I hope you can see the creepy puppet. It's creeping me out. I hope it's creeping you out too. Um, so we've also got, we've got the forking paths for the Gothic and romance. And here I'm talking not about romance subplots which appear in the Gothic, but novels in which the Gothic and romance are both significant parts of the text. So we've got the, um, the sort of descendants of Jane Eyre and often um, a lot of the Gothics might fit into this category. We've also got, I think, Jamaica Inn as a useful text for exploring a different type of romance, which we can also consider to be Gothic or engaging with the Gothic mode. So the difference there between a genre and a mode. A genre is, is more closely defined and a mode is a sense of perhaps reused tropes and aesthetics and concerns. It's a bit more general. Um, and then we've also got the Austin-esque Gothic, and you can see that picture there from the delightful um, ITV uh, adaptation of Northanger Abbey. So very quickly, we're going to go over those Jane narratives because we've already talked about them, basically. Pivotal features and concerns of this sort of style of Gothic romance or this path for Gothic romance is a protagonist entering new social and physical spaces, often populated by anti-heroes and super males or in queer romance that the gender doesn't necessarily apply. Um, and key concerns involve hierarchies of power and class and social advancement. But you also have this kind of interest in anti-heroes or super males that offer access to a world beyond the everyday. And that's particularly where you're going to end up uh, edging off into paranormal romance. I'm not going to talk in detail about paranormal romance because it's an incredibly complex and developing field. There's so many subgenres. Um, there's a whole lecture to be done about the development of paranormal romance and key texts, etc. But you can see some of my collection there and some of some key notes of the paranormal romance. I've already mentioned some of the steps there um, where the gothic uh, romance hero, that dark hero, melted, melded into the vampiric hero. So the second path that I'm going to talk about is related to Jamaica Inn. So once again, this is a Daphne du Maurier, and you do have this uneasy relationship with love. So Mary Yellen um, goes to live with her aunt and her uncle-in-law, and um, she moves to an inn. So she's actually lowering her social status. She's moving into the criminal classes as she goes. Um, and the romantic love interest is her uncle's brother, Jem, who you can see in the picture there. This is from the BBC adaptation. But there is throughout this discomfort with love and what it does to female autonomy. So perhaps, again, borrowing from Emily Bronte, but being much more direct about it. So we're told at one point when she realizes that she loves him, he had been the unknown factor from the beginning to the end, from that first morning when he had come to the bar in Jamaica Inn, and deliberately she had shut her eyes to the truth. She was a woman and for no reason on, in heaven or earth, she loved him. He had kissed her and she was bound to him forever. She felt herself fallen and degraded, weakened in mind and body, who had been strong before, and her pride had gone with her independence. Romantic stuff. Um, you can definitely see that sort of critique or discomfort with love as a salvific narrative. But what's more important about Jamaica in, in terms of how it, you can see it influencing and developing um, the intersection of Gothic romance in other works 
is the fact that it's about a move into a lower social setting. Um, it's focusing on lower or working class identities and, um, and it's also not about negotiating a dangerous new world with distant threats. It's about living in a world which is inherently threatening and inherently oppressive and surviving it, often through complex moral decisions, interpretations of the world around you, um, and responding and surviving threats. So I think we can see the inheritance of this kind of novel in something that's not often considered in Gothic scholarship, but the working class women's romance. Um, so writers like Catherine Cookson, Meg Hutchison, Josephine Cox, etc. They're also sometimes known as the family saga. Christian Marion Fraser is another um, one of my favorites. And what we see here um, is this sort of, again, this lower class Gothic novel. So you're not being threatened by aristocrats necessarily. So Catherine Cook's in The Rag Nymph um, from 1991, of which there was an ITV adaptation, which is very good, I recommend. Um, there's a brief case study in how we consider this romance to be Gothic. So there's an orphaned heroine, very familiar to us from Gothic texts. Um, there's an exploration, she's um, abandoned, sort of that's the Cliff Notes version, abandoned in a Victorian era slums and ends up being raised by a rag woman. But these Victorian era slums, perhaps not reminiscent of Jane Eyre, but they're certainly reminiscent of the back streets of London from, for example, Jekyll and Hyde or even Dracula. There's constant threats to the heroine from the threat of forced prostitution to the paedophile ring which wants to pick her up as a child. Um, she also faces extreme sexual harassment from an employer and an equal relationship with a little lordling who will only agree to make her his mistress. And she also faces kidnap. Here, though, as in many Gothic novels, Gothic romances, love is the secular scripture. Um, basically, the thing that can save or save the heroine or um, create a happy ending, create a closed narrative. And again, we have that brother lover that I talked about with Joan Fobson. Not literally, not literally. Um, although in this particular text, there is a quasi brother relationship because they're foster brother and sister. The brother lover is just the brother protector. This idea of a character who's, um, you know, been known to you for a long time is a friend or a relation of some sort. And they became, um, Joan Forbes is talking about the 18th century, but we can see it here as well, that they became prized and cherished. A uh, prized and cherished means of obtaining respect and affection as well as protection from sexual advances. And that's what we have in the Rag Nymph. So there are many, many working class women's romances which quite clearly fit into the Gothic category. Um, and one of the big differences is the type of hero, as I've mentioned, they're, they're usually quiet heroes. And why? I'm quoting myself here from an article that I've just, uh, that has been published this year. So sorry, but I don't, there's not much writing on it. Um, the world which these texts depict is one in which the aristocratic dark hero is frequently a source of fear without hope. In a world which not only recognizes but focalizes the inequalities of class as well as gender, a hero who upholds or represents both of those systems of oppression holds little appeal to those who are already victims of them. So these texts are not often recognized as Gothic, but they have many Gothic equivalents. Part of the reason they're not recognized is they don't fit these aristocratic models of, um, of romance in which you're entering for the first time into a world of threat. The, the heroines of working class women's romance are born into a world of threat and oppression and have to survive it rather than escape it. Okay, the last one I'm gonna talk about is the Austenesque romance and the 18th century legacy. So we've talked about Jane Eyre and its influence on the Gothic romance and on romance in the 20th century. But what's often missed is the continuing influence of 18th century Gothic tropes um, and stories and texts on the romance going into the 20th century. And one of the best examples of this is Georgia Heyer. And we find in, in her works often a debt owed to the 18th century. So I picked a few books out here which engage with the Gothic. They, you might not agree that they're a Gothic text, but they are engaging with the Gothic mode. So they're using the Gothic as part of their, their toolkit. Um, the Black Moth was Georgette Hare's first novel, and it's fairly sort of just straightforward gothic villainy. Um, the main character, Andover, is uh, a kidnapper and a ravisher. 
um, but he was also the most compelling character. <laughs> so uh, he was repurposed in these old shades as the Duke of Avon and he became the anti-hero. Although still pretty dark, even by Byronic standards, he ends the novel forcing somebody to commit suicide publicly. Yay, romantic. Um, and you've also got novels like The Quiet Gentleman, where you have a move into something which is much more like the Jane Austen parody, Northanger Abbey. You have a gothic world which um, is being addressed through light humour and parody. But it's still a gothic world. Gervais, the hero, is under threat when he returns home. He's continually having to avoid being murdered and a threat from inside his own home, secret passageways, betrayal, inheritance drama. Um, but you also have these aspects of um, parody that are going on. So for example, one of the key techniques here is the anti-Gothic, Gothic heroine, Drusilla, who um, unlike, so she's always bemoaning the fact that she's not a Gothic heroine. She says, you know, I should be fainting more. I should be swooning. Oh, he'd fall in love with me if I was swooning, but instead I just bandaged his wound like an idiot. Um, but you have this sense of these anti-Gothic Gothic heroines depict the kind of heroine that would actually survive in a Gothic world, in a world of threat and fear. Um, and a world that isn't all about overdramatics, um, but is a world in which practical people have to live. Um, the Reluctant Widow is another example of a Gothic text where it uses this Gothic subplot or partial plot of um, there's a death in it, there's uh, hidden passageways, there's smuggling, there's state secrets, there's the enemy with France, which is very 18th century. Um, and again, you have some elements of Gothic parody, but you're mixing these Gothic elements with often with light humor. But that existence of humor doesn't negate the Gothic nature of the text. As we find with Gothic romance or the Gothics themselves, um, we're not concentrating on terror and darkness necessarily in these texts. We're reaching towards a happy ever after. It just gets represented in different ways. So the austin -esque Gothic um, is defined by a number of qualities. First of all, there's intertextual referencing. So Hare often makes deliberate references to other texts. So in The Quiet Gentleman, she references um, Robert Southey and she re re um, references Horace Walpole. And she also uses her description of the house, for example, to mirror the description of Manderley and Rebecca. Um, there's often elements of parody, but it's a parody which re reveals an underlying Gothic world. And this is very much the technique that you find in Northanger Abbey as a Gothic parody. So in Catherine Morland in Northanger Abbey is always misinterpreting things. She thinks that Colonel Tilney or General Tilney, I can never remember, is, um, you know, she thinks he's a murderer, he's a kidnapper, he's kept his wife captive. Of course he hasn't. But her gothic lens allows her to see a reality that other people ignore or fail to see. The fact that he is a villain, um, the fact that his wife was a victim of spousal abuse, the fact that he's a domineering, tyrannical patriarch who is sucking the life out of his family. And the fact that he's the kind of man who just throw um, a young girl sort of out into the night. And by the standards of the time, that was pretty grim. Um, so the same you're getting with these austin -esque gothics, this parody that un unveils a world below, which is still gothic despite the light humor. You've got your anti-gothic gothic heroines. You've got quite frequently, you've got quiet heroes, but you also get some of the dark heroes. In the case of these old shades, they're very much anti-hero, almost villains. Um, a celebration of the beast in certain ways. Certainly in these old shades, Leonie loves him because he's a beast. So just to finish, I'm going to talk about um, the end point to some extent of these Austin-esque uh, gothics. So it's not just Georgette Hare. You can, you can find a lot of these tropes in a number of Regency romances or historical romances more generally, but we get them very clearly and very literally, obviously, in the literary mashups like Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, which is amazing and you should all read it because it's great. It's much, much better than Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. And what you have here are all of these aspects. You have intertextual referencing, obviously, to um, uh, Sense and Sensibility. You have parody and an underlying Gothic world. You have these anti-Gothic heroines. You have quiet heroes. And you have this use of parody to underline 
what was inherent in the original Austinian text. So a lonely man with a tragic past becomes a man cursed with uh, a sea witch's tentacles. An irresponsible seducer, Willoughby, becomes an octopus manipulator. He has an octopus whistle that he can call octopuses to attack the object of his affection and then he rescues them. Um, a devious social climber, Lucy, becomes a, a sea witch and you have the stultified bride of convenience, um, Middleton's wife, who ends up being a captured trophy wife. So I think here you're finding this gothic exaggeration and parody is actually being used to underline um, the problems and the satirical and parodic targets of Austen originally. So I'm hoping that from this discussion, we'll have seen that the gothic and the romance are together forever, going on into the past and on into the future in ways that I've not necessarily talked about. There's further reading here, and I'm going to put up the reading list on my website, which you can access on my Twitter page. Um, I've got lots and lots and lots of further reading and secondary texts. Um, these are just the secondary texts that I mentioned. So we have, um, oh, yellow wallpaper. Um, we have five minutes before the end. So if there's anything that you would like to say or ask, then please do so. Oh my gosh. Fallen woman in the Gothic Romance. You turn in the film. Um, so the fallen woman in Gothic Romance, I'd probably have to think about this a little bit uh, more in depth and on the fly right now. Um, but the fallen woman in the Gothic Romance of the 20th century is quite frequently that other woman um, compared to the more pure and perfect heroine herself. So the fallen woman often occurs as a secondary foil character in Gothic romances still. Um, I do not have a newsletter, but um, if you fill in the Google form, you should be able to see when the other classes are. And I'll, obviously I'll be posting them on Twitter all the time. Or if you... Um, find my blog on Twitter. I can post updates on my blog as well. And then you can follow that probably. I'm not quite sure about how to do newsletters yet. I'm going to get around to it. I didn't expect so many people to be interested. Um, yield, I can repost the Google form for you. Okay. Um, here you go. Um, so I saw somebody Yeah, so the Gothic films of the 40s, those paranoid women films are definitely very closely related to the Gothic romance. They tended to be, um, following the footsteps perhaps of Rebecca, they tended to be that little bit darker, obviously, than the Gothic romance. But the Gothic romance is sort of the twist to good, twist to the happy ever after, arguably, um, of that. I mean, Dragonwick's an interesting question. Dragonwick is quite clearly also like in the Gothic romance sphere. Um, and that's why Gaywick is called Gaywick. Um, fun fact. Do, do, do. Oh, I think I just sent something to Elizabeth privately. Did anyone, oh, why am I sending everything to Elizabeth? I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I want to send it to everyone. That's so weird. It was set to Elizabeth. Okay, there's a form for everyone. Um, <laughs> let me just see. Ooh. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions. I'm not sure if I'm going to get time to answer it before it stops us talking, but I'll try and get through a few. So what do I think the next wave of Gothic narratives are beginning to focus on in terms of transgression? I mean, I think we're already getting them. Um, and we see that more in the way in which the Gothic has melded into horror. If you're thinking about um, body horror, uh, torture porn, such as things like Saw and Hostel, and also the work of writers like Chuck Palahniuk and this um, intense interest in the, the sort of grotesque um, and sort of monstrous transgression. I think those are where that's going. And you've also got like the French new wave horror, um, the, that sort of, uh, I think it's called that, um, and Martyrs, I think is the film. Um, that's kind of a good example of where the Gothic's going in terms of transgression. The Gothic and the Romance are both related to medieval stuff, 100%. That's where the terms both came from in the 18th century. So Gothic, um, at the time of when Walpole was talking about the story, the Gothic was more or less a catch-all term for the medieval. Um, and the Romance was very clearly associated with those medieval epics and stories. So yes, 
Um, obviously for Horace Walpole, his stories were very much set in the medieval time. And you do get some other Gothic writers doing that, but not necessarily that many. Um, there's a move into the 15th and 16th centuries and then into the 17th and increasingly towards sort of contemporary to the writing of the text. Do, 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 do. Yep, film noir, same, very Gothic sensibilities. Um, Uh, yeah, somebody else has asked me about film now, it might be the same person, but yes, I think, um, I mean, this is to some extent um, a different um, set of directions. So the Gothic as a mode splintered off in lots of different directions. So you've got its influence on the detective story, you've got its influence on science fiction, um, you've got its influence on romance, and those all branched off in different directions. So I would say that film noir is quite clearly connected to that uh, merging of the Gothic into detective fiction. <laughs> um, yeah, so different Gothics have different focuses, like um, they're often um, related to specific contexts or um, so obviously Southern Gothic is often um, addressing issues um, related to, for example, the legacy of slavery and so on and so forth. And you do get um, Gothic from different periods addressing different concerns. So a lot of the stuff that I look at the 18th century, um, it was being written around the time of the French Revolution. So it's very clearly um, engaging with these conceptions of um, tyranny and, and uh, aristocratic rule, but also this fear of mob violence, etc. cetera. Do, do, do. Um, Oh yeah, totally. Flowers in the Attic would be a great text to compare to Jane Eyre. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. I think I've got to the bottom of the comments. Um, yeah, like I need to reread The Flowers in the Attic because I haven't reread really it since I was a teenager. So I'd have to reread it and think about it. But um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, connection to make there. Um, and it was my pleasure um, to uh, give this lecture. I'm going to be soup cheeky just in case everyone didn't get the, um, Thing at the beginning and pop up my Kofi and then the uh, the video links as well if you want to follow along. Um, has everybody got the form link to the Google? Like if anyone doesn't have access to the form just give me a shout. Um, okay so hopefully that's it. I talk super fast then. I'm quite impressed with the, how fast I managed to get those questions answered. Um, does anyone have anything else before Zoom cuts us off? Could you repost the form link? Yep. Oh, again. It's, they do tend to get consumed by the flow of messages, don't they? Um, it was my pleasure. Thank you to everybody who came. Um, and do feel free to turn your microphones on and say goodbye. I guess I've just been sat in my kitchen for two hours on my own. <laughs> so, um, but I think, I think that's goodbye from me. And yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It's so weird. I've only been seeing one person the whole time because everybody else <laughs> was on dark screen, apart from the person that I already knew before, before I came to this talk. So I'm sorry I didn't really see many of you, um, but it was great to be here with you anyway. Um, so yeah. Um, I will see you later. I'm going to finish the chat now. So if there's anything that you want to do before you go, um, just do it quickly. And then I'm going to um, close the Zoom uh, space. And yeah. See you next time. See you next Thank time. You. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm closing now. So goodbye.